I'm Father Luis Toro, and I apologize for the inconvenience. We had to cut the transmission because of a failure on our internet connection. Now we come back thanking God that he gave us the opportunity to film and now do the live broadcast for this second part, Saturday or Sunday, with our Adventist brothers and sisters. Remember, we are working to sponsor this book, El Rescate, The Rescue. We are trying to rescue the truth, that the world may find the truth. Truth has been lost in the world. So we recommend this book widely. It can help you out to strengthen your faith and find the truth. So this way you support our ministry. Before I start, I have to thank my sister Isabel Torrado from Bolsas Contreras, who has opened her home to broadcast to all of you. Thank you, Isabelita, for being here. Say hi to the viewers and followers. Thank you very much, Isabel. God bless you. Thanks to her and to her company who gave us a chance to do the broadcast. Continue watching this video with so much love, with joy. Grab a paper and a pen, your Bible, no matter what religion you belong to. The main thing here is that you love the truth. Why do Catholics keep Sunday and not Saturday? With biblical foundations. So you'll see if they were able to demonstrate with the Bible that the Saturday is the one to be kept. According to the Bible in the New Testament, you'll see that they had no answer. Why? Because there's none in the Bible's New Testament. Look at the challenge I have for the pastors. If one of you show me in the Bible that we have to keep the Saturday in the New Testament, that the apostles kept the Saturday, I, myself, will stop being a priest and convert to Adventist. They wasted the opportunity. Why? Because that is not in the Bible. And I'm sure of it. That's why I made the challenge. Take advantage. Enjoy and study the word of the Lord. May God bless you and keep you. We'll see you at the end. Let us continue. It's all recorded and filmed. You should analyze it. This is on YouTube. You can check it out later in the internet. Now we are going to talk about Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be recorded and filmed to be seen by the whole world with Bible quotations, chapters, and verses. And you can look it up in your own Bible. One of the things to look for if somewhere in the New Testament is commanded to keep the Saturday. They are supposed to give chapters and verses showing in the New Testament that we Christians have to keep the Saturday. If they don't show it, we can't do nothing you'll see that they did not show it at all. I want you to use a magnifier glass and pay attention to the chapter or verses they quote. Look that I'm telling you before, so they keep it in mind in order to quote chapters or verses where it is commanded to keep the Saturday to us Christians, not the Jews. To us Christians in the New Testament and where in the Bible says that the early Christians congregated on Saturdays. That did not happen. It's not in the Bible. It might be that this brother say, I have to quote, then we'll give him a chance to show it, but that cannot happen. And I'm going to show him that in the New Testament, Christians used to congregate on Sundays. They worship the Lord on Sunday. I'm going to give you the chapters and verses. And you're simply going to see. 
if I'm telling you lies. It is the opportunity for these brothers to show with quotes from the New Testament. I want to make myself clear where it says that Christians, not the Jews, because we know that Jews meet on Saturdays. I don't want to quote saying that the Jews, it must say Christians, because I can show you where it says that Christians used to congregate on Sundays. So the thing is to look up in the Bible and check if it is true. Anyhow, I want you to pay attention because we are going to have an agreement with the brother who's going to talk. Please come closer, brother. What is your name? Samuel. Samuel Velasco. Brother Samuel Velasco. Now please pay attention because we are going to have an agreement, the two of us. There are two ways of taking this topic. I respect the choice you take. There are two choices. You choose one. He proposed me one. And I want him to say the one he told me when we were talking. I'm going to say why I don't agree. Actually, there's more than one way, not one nor two, of approaching a topic so important like this. One is where you expose and everybody pays attention and then the other one exposes. Another way is one exposes, the other one exposes, and then there's an opportunity to make questions to one another. Because there are things said that remain in the air and are not shown in the Word of God or out of context. So there must be a time to interact to make things clear. Another one is you expose, I expose, then questions between the two of us, giving the audience a chance to participate with questions. Because I think we are all Christians and students of the Bible, so we all can participate and ask questions, and also argue, not only two exposers participating here. Do you know why I don't agree with the last one? Because how many of you are going to ask a question to him? Raise your hand those who want to ask a question. There's not enough time today, nor tomorrow, maybe not even the day after tomorrow. It would be a chaos. But look, what you are going to ask him, I already know it. I can make the questions for you. Not a problem. What the Adventists are supposed to question, who else but you, my friend? As you can see, there's no need. If the idea is that people talk, then why am I here? If I come here, it's because people want to listen, not to question. So if you prefer questions and answer, it's okay. I want you to choose. The last one I don't accept. It's because there are so many that want to question and there's no time. But I accept any one of the others, the one you choose. One, you said you expose, I expose, and people draw conclusions. Two, you expose, I expose, you ask me questions, I answer, I ask, and you respond. Three, you can say, Mr. Priest, we keep Saturday because of this and this and this. And I would say, I don't agree for this reason and this. And you'll tell me, but here it says this. And I'll tell you, it also says this. 
and we are quoting the Bible and people is realizing because you know the Bible and I do too. I want you to choose. You choose the way you want to work. What you want. I accept your opinion. Say it out loud so the audience may see that I did not force you, that you chose it. I personally think that I don't know everything because the Bible is a treasure too big, isn't it? And was revealed by God and to know God's thoughts completely. So since I don't know everything, perhaps I cannot question everything and maybe you have important questions to ask because you also study the Bible and perhaps you say things that I don't know and maybe my brothers in the church ask questions that I don't know. It might be we don't know everything. We are learning constantly, aren't we? Now, the dynamics that allow the audience to ask questions is interesting because we allow them to participate, but you are the one to say how it's going to be. You are the one to set up the rules. So let's do it in one of the two ways proposed that you accept. I explain why I don't agree, and you think that people have studied the Bible enough, But you know, Catholics are too lazy. Not this ones, of course, but the ones that have not showed up and study Bible. So here I am representing them, and you can represent the Adventists. One and one. I don't think that one of your brothers in your church may do a better job than you as a church pastor and try to teach you. Since you are the one who preaches every time, if he teaches me through the Bible and shows me with the Bible, I accept it because the Bible has authority. It is okay. But I don't agree because it's going to be a mess. Choose one of the others. You expose, I expose. Then you say, let me explain, and I do the same. Or let's do the debate. You say, and I say, and keep going back and forth, back and forth. Or you expose, and I expose, and we both ask questions at the end. Let's do the second option. Let's check this out. You expose, I expose. Is that correct? And then questions between us. Let's give an applause to this brother. How long are you going to expose? Okay, I do it first. I don't know if you agree with me. He said he had time for a vigil tonight. And I can do that too. I dance to the beat and rhythm he plays. I say one hour. Let's see what the audience want. One hour me and one hour him. One hour me and one hour him and one more hour for questions and answers. Total three hours. Agree? No? How about half hour? Raise your hands. That is half and half. And one hour for questions and answers. 
Do you agree? Please raise your hands. Because in questions and answers, half hour is not enough to respond. Otherwise, we could go direct to the questions and answer. He asks, I respond, then I ask, and then he responds. So on. Let me ask my brother, do you agree on questions and answers only? I ask, you respond, you ask, and I respond with respect. You can't tell me we keep Saturday because of this and this and this, and I say I don't agree because of this and this and this. Do you agree? I think we can do better if each one of us take half an hour to expose one topic and half an hour for questions and answers. Okay. Let's begin by saying that in the Old Testament you are going to hear more than one quote that he is going to give you. More than one, commanding to keep the Saturday. That's why I won't do it. He is the one to say it in the Old Testament. What he cannot tell me is that in the New Testament there's a command of keeping the Saturday and so on. He cannot show me that the early Christians used to congregate for worshiping the Lord on Saturdays. If he can't show me that, I give up. Stop being a priest and convert to the Adventist. That is not possible. He is going to have half an hour to demonstrate I'm going to show him that early Christians in the New Testament did not keep the Saturday, but Sunday. In the Old Testament, they kept the Saturday, but not in the New. Why we won't keep the Saturday, but the Sunday? If in the Old Testament it was commanded? Because Jesus Christ came and brought us a new covenant. It is written in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21st. Verse 21. There's a new covenant, and the old one is not upon us. We take it in consideration, but it's not upon us. Listen, you who desire to be under the law. You who desire to be under the law. This was in the Old Testament. You who desire to be under law. Do you not hear the law? Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Here is the example. Listen carefully. One by a slave. One by a slave. One by a free woman. And one by a free woman. His wife. His wife. But the son of the slave. The son of the slave. Was born according to the flesh. Was born according to the flesh. The son of the free woman. Through promise. Therefore, it is showing that one is God's promise and the other word could have been from anywhere. Now, this is an allegory. Here, here, again. These women are two covenants. That's it. Here, symbolically, we recognize two covenants. The old and the new one. The first one. The first one is from Mount Sinai. Do you remember where the Ten Commandments were given to Moses? The first one is from Mount Sinai, where the tables of the law, the Ten Commandments, were given to Moses. The first one, continue. She is Hagar. That is Hagar. The ones who fulfill the law are slaves. 
Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She was from Arabia, from Mount Sinai, where Moses received the tables of the law. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery. We don't want to belong to that one, as her children, the ones who follow the old covenant. But the Jerusalem of old, the one from above, where we want to be, is free. Is what? Is free. And she is our mother. And she is our mother. Go on. For it is written, for it is written, and cannot fail. Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in travail. For the children of the desolate one are many more than the children of her that is married. Now we, brethren like Isaac, you like Isaac, are children of promise, are children of promise, of the new covenant. But as then, so here comes what I want you to focus, but as then, but as then, the Son represents the flesh. The Son represents the flesh in the Old Testament and the Old Law, Moses' Law, the one with the tables of the Law. It prosecuted Isaac. It prosecuted Isaac, the New Testament. He is gonna be prosecuted, pay attention. Persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So it is now. But what does Scripture say? But what does the Scripture say? Scripture, not Father Luis Toro. Attune your ears. Use a magnifier glass to see. Cast out the slave. Cast out the slave. The slave represented Hagar from Mount Sinai, from the Old Covenant, where the tables of the law were given to Moses by God in Mount Sinai. Cast out the slave and her son. And here, son for the son of the slave, for the son of the slave shall not inherit, shall not inherit with the son of the free woman, with the son of the free woman. It's all behind. Now comes the free woman in the New Testament. So, brethren, brethren, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. We are not children of the slave. New Testament, new covenant, not of the slave. For freedom Christ has set us free. Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And do not submit again, like the people of Israel, to a yoke of slavery. Now I, Paul, say to you, now I, Paul, say to you, that if you receive circumcision, that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Christ will be of no advantage to you. Listen carefully. This is what Paul says. I testify again, pay attention. To every man who receives circumcision, to every man who receives circumcision, that he is bound to keep the whole law, that he is bound to keep the circumcised ones. Are you circumcised? So we are not bound to keep the whole law from Mount Sinai, from the Old Covenant, from Hagar. No, but the circumcised are. You are severe from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You are severe from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, as this brother says. We are the Church of Christ because we keep the law and the Ten Commandments. You are severe from Christ. You are severe from Christ because He brought us a new covenant and you don't accept it. But to stay stuck to the old covenant, you have fallen away from grace. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit by faith, for through the Spirit by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. Aha, uh -huh, go on. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail. Not anymore, it's not important for us. Go on. But faith working through love. You were running well. We are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? How is that? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? 
What is the truth? The one of the Old Covenant and Mount Sinai represented by Hagar? Or the one from the New Testament represented by Sarah and Isaac? That is ours. Go on. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and he who is troubling. Listen, there's someone who is troubling to those of the New Testament and the New Covenant. But those who trouble, whether it be the Adventist, Jew, or whatever denomination, will bear judgment. Will bear judgment. But if brethren, but if brethren, still preach circumcision, still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Go on. That case, the stumbling block of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would mutilate themselves. Again, I wish those who unsettle you would mutilate themselves. Mutilate themselves. Remember, we should leave the Old Covenant and pass to the New One. Is what we are concerned for, the one started by Jesus Christ and inherited to us. We keep Sundays instead of Saturdays. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 8 tells us in summary that long ago people of Israel used to keep Saturday. But now God in the new covenant proposes other day. Not Saturday, but another day that we call Sunday instead, the next day. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later of another day. God spoke later of another day. In the Old Covenant, it was a day, but now in the New Covenant, there's another day. Let's check what other day. We are going to look it up in the Bible when Jesus rises up. Christians are going to keep Sunday. See John chapter 20, verse 1. Jesus rises up. Let's begin there. Why do we keep Sunday? Because a new covenant starts. Jesus Christ rises and the old one has been already left behind. Now, on the first day of the week, here it is clear that it's Sunday a day after Saturday. God indicated another day. The first day after Saturday. The next day. Mary Magdalene. You already know the story. Mary Magdalene found that Jesus had reason. Now pay attention to verse 19. Check if Jesus agrees to meet with the disciples on Sunday or not. Verse 19. On that same day. The same day. After Saturday. Sunday. The first one after Saturday. The same day. The first one after Saturday. For if somebody doubted, the first one after Saturday. Attune your ears, get focused, make a close-up to see Christians congregated on Sunday. Listen carefully. The doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Let's see if Jesus confirmed, agrees or doesn't agree. If he doesn't agree with Christians to be assembled on Sunday, Jesus won't show up there. But if he does, he confirms to keep Sunday. Pay attention. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, He spoke to them where they were gathered together, the disciples, not the Jews. Christians, they were meeting on Sunday, doors being shut. Nothing stops Christ being with his disciples. He is God, although doors were shut. He comes to tell them that they can gather together on Sunday. They were all gathered together. He came in with the doors being shut and talks to them calmly. 
But not only that Sunday, on verse 26 says, Eight days later. Eight days later? What day was that? Sunday. His disciples were again in the house. Not the Jews. Christians were assembled on Sunday. And Thomas was with them. And Thomas was with them. The doors were shut. The doors were shut. But Jesus came and stood among them. He confirms to be assembled on Sundays. He agrees. Because of his resurrection on Sunday, Christians worship on Sundays. And the Bible says that not only for that moment, theologically, he is saying that Christians must gather together on Sundays and that Christ confirms that meaning. Different from the Jews, that was a day before, on Saturday. All of that happens when Christ rises, Christ dies, He goes to heaven and left His disciples alone. They have to gather together. Let us see what day they gather for worshiping. Acts 27. What day they gather for worshiping. Acts 27. Remember, Acts of the Apostles is what they actually did, what the early Christians did, what the Apostles did. That's why we gather on Sundays. On the first day of the week. Repeat it again, Luis. On the first day of the week. By third time, on the first day of the week. When we were gathered together to break bread. Gather together to break bread. Christians gather together on Sundays. They celebrated the breaking of bread, the Eucharist, on the first day of the week. Time passed and St. Paul comes to write on, on 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Let us check if Christians gather together on Saturday. I'm showing you several quotes and I need this brother to show me where it says in the Bible that Christians gather on Saturday. There are a few cameras here. I'm throwing down a challenge. I give up and stop being a priest and convert to Adventist before the whole world. But if you don't show it, you'll understand that you have been fooled. And I have to tell you humbly and with love that you are in an error. First of Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the contribution, concerning the contribution for the same, for the same, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. Let us see what were the rules. Pay attention. On the first day of every week. Say it again. On the first day of every week. Every Sunday. Why is he collecting on Sundays? Do you think that Paul can't collect on Sundays if Christians do not gather on Sundays? Who's going to give him something? Nobody. On the first day of every week. Again, Luis. On the first day of every week. They gather together every Sunday. First day of the week. Use a magnifier glass here to see. It means Christians gather together every Sunday. I expect he will do the same as I did. If not, you can get your own conclusions. Anyway, here comes the debate. To our Adventist brothers and sisters, I don't know if they do this, but I have heard to say, Constantine was the one who invented Sunday. No, he didn't. I'm going to demonstrate that you have been fooled. Do you want to know who invented Sunday? Sunday didn't exist before. But if it did, one of you can show me, the brother who's going to talk to me. Do you know the meaning of Sunday? Day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, did not exist that day of the Lord. There was the day of resting. Saturday, day of resting, but not the day of the Lord. And for the first time, it was named day of the Lord by St. John in Revelation 1.10.
For the first time, we can find in sacred scriptures day of the Lord, not day of resting as the Jews did, but day of the Lord. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Holy Spirit took me on the day of the Lord. That's why it is named Sunday, day of the Lord, not established by Constantine, but by St. John in Revelation 1.10. If this is Lord's day, then you'll understand why Christians gather together on Sundays, because it is the day of the Lord. It is so important for us, the day of the Lord. We gather together, the same as early Christian communities, to celebrate with joy the resurrection of the Lord. See by yourselves that Jesus Christ himself said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. There in Mark chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus Christ himself come to say that he is Lord of Sabbath. And what does it mean, Lord of Sabbath? Let's see. One Sabbath, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Then verse 27, to move up. And he said to them, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for the man. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, not man for Sabbath. What is he saying with these words? That we should not slave ourselves. That was for Jewish people. Listen how it ends. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He is the owner of the Sabbath too, so he can do whatever he wants. So, so, if he wants to switch for Sunday, he does. He's the boss. Now, Jesus Christ, Lord of the Sabbath, do you know why did they kill him and criticize him? John chapter 5 verse 18, as the Adventists do with us Catholics, saying, you are not the Church of Christ because you don't keep the Saturday. They said the same thing to Jesus Christ, that he was not the Son of God, that he was not a true Christian. Let me say this, because he didn't keep the Sabbath, and he will be killed for, like Catholics, not keeping the Sabbath. Let's see John 5.18. This was why the Jews saw it all the more to kill him. This was why the Jews saw it all the more to kill him. He not only broke the Sabbath, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his Father, making himself equal to God. Why did they want to kill him? Because he didn't keep the Sabbath. According to them, Jesus Christ didn't keep the Sabbath. Why do Adventists say that we are not the Church of Christ? Because we don't keep the Sabbath. But notice that who really kept the Sabbath was Jesus Christ. That's why he said in John 19.30 that everything was accomplished. Do you know what he said? That everything was accomplished. He accomplished everything. And what did he accomplish? Look, he died on Friday and Saturday rested. Then rose on Sunday. He accomplished the Old Covenant. Now he can say, it is finished. He accomplished the Old Covenant. Now we must start the New Covenant. Because when Christ died, rested on Saturday, he accomplished the Old Testament. Now we are in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 7, verse 1 and following. How many? Thanks. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 
and followings. Christ dies and with his death gives a step into the New Testament. He accomplished everything. It is finished. He rested on Saturday. Now, if he accomplished everything, we can already get into the New Testament. He dies and when he rises, starts a New Testament. Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. Say that again. Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. Stop there. For I am speaking to those who know the law. Who was speaking? Paul. And do you know who Paul was? Acts 22, 1 and following. Paul says, I am Pharisee, son of Pharisees, and raised at the feet of Gamaliel. Do you know who Gamaliel was? The very best in law matters. And Paul says, For I am speaking to those who know the law. Paul knows the law. Paul is not telling lies. Paul is a Jew. He knows the law of the Ten Commandments. But we are going to see what Paul says, that the law is biting on a person only during his life, that the law is binding on a person only during his life, only during his life. Thus, our married woman, thus, our married woman is bound by law to her husband, is bound by law to her husband as long as he leaves, as long as he leaves. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. She can marry. She's free. Continue. While her husband is still. While what? While her husband is still. As long as he leaves. But if her husband dies, she committed adultery. If she has sexual relations with another man. While Christ was alive, if you didn't keep the Sabbath, you committed sin. So when Christ dies, he's free from all his duties. We are free of the old covenant. And if she marries another man, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. She is not an adulteress. She is not in sin. Likewise, my brethren, likewise, my brethren, you have died to the law. You have died to the law. Paul knows the law. The center of the Jewish law was the Ten Commandments. You have died to the law. You have died to the law. Don't tell me that Paul did not know what was the law. And do not tell me that Paul is speaking about another law. He is speaking about the law of the Jews. He is a Pharisee raised at the feet of Gamaliel through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. We already belong, not to the Old Testament, but the new one, to Christ. Now we belong to Christ risen. Therefore, Christians don't keep the Saturday, but Sunday. And Christ is present in the midst of them on Sunday because they belong to the Lord risen. And that's what we celebrate, the resurrection of the Lord. How much do I have left? Five? But now we are discharged from the law dead to what which held us captive. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive. We have been released from the law. We have been released from the law, but not the Adventists, so that we serve not under the old written code, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit, but in the new life of the Spirit. This is new, and perhaps the Adventist brother may say, this refers to the ceremonial, not to the moral law, or to the washing of hands and some other laws, but not to the Ten Commandments. I'm going to show you that refers to the Ten Commandments. In 2 of Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 and followings, refers to the Ten Commandments given in tables of stone. 
God gave them to Moses, but that lasts until Christ. Listen, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3 and following, 3, 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. Nobody can deny that you belong to Christ. You are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry. The result of our ministry written not with ink. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. You pay attention. You can see that it is speaking of the Ten Commandments of the law. Not on the tables of stone. Where were the Ten Commandments written? Don't tell me that it refers to the ceremonial law. It refers to the moral law. The Ten Commandments written on tables of stone, but on the tables of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ our God. Not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. That doesn't come from us, nor from the popes, not an invention from priests, not from Constantine. That competence is from God. That competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. Who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. Not in a written code, but in the Spirit. Not in a written code for the Jewish people. For the written code kills. For the written on tables of stone kills. But the Spirit gives life. Go on. When the law was written on tables of stone. When the law was written on tables of stone. What is referring to? To the Ten Commandments. That ministry take you to death. That ministry take you to death. But Christ sets a new covenant. Came with such splendor. But it was surrounded by splendor. Remember when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai? His splendor was glory. Go on. That the Israelites could not look at Moses' face. That happened when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments and the brightness of his fading as it was. Because of its brightness. And the brightness of his and use the magnifier glass. Fading as it was. It was fading. Do you know what it means? Temporary. Will not the dispensation of the Spirit be attended with greater splendor? What a splendor will shine upon us in the New Testament for the dispensation of the Spirit. For the dispensation of the Spirit. For if there was splendor in the dispensation of condemnation. For if there was splendor in the dispensation of condemnation that they want to remain in. The dispensation of righteousness must far exceed it in splendor. Indeed, in this case, what once had splendor has come to have not splendor at all. Nothing to compare, and they believe it is the best. For it was faded away, came with splendor. It was faded away, temporary, and they say it is eternal. What is permanent must have much more splendor. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are very bold. Not like Moses. Not like Moses. Who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not see the end of the fading splendor. That was going to fade away. It was temporary. But their minds were hardened. But their minds were hardened. Not only them, but some others too. But their minds were hardened. That same veil remains unlifted. The same veil remains unlifted. When they read the Old Covenant, when they read the Old Covenant, to this day, to this day, that's why Adventists don't understand. Because only through Christ it is taken away. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, whenever they read the Bible, a veil lies over their minds. A veil lies over their minds. To this day, to this day, they cannot realize why true Christians, why Catholics, keep Sunday instead of Saturdays. Because a veil remains over their minds until now. 
It is written in the sacred scriptures, finished. Now is my brother's turn. Don't forget the proposal I've made to him. Where Christians keep the Saturday, not the Jews. Well, according to what has been exposed by the priest Luis Toro, in summary, trying to say in one phrase what he just stated. He says that law is not current for Christians anymore because it was for the Old Testament and for the Jews. Therefore, Saturday, neither. But Saturday, according to Exodus 20, is the fourth commandment of the law of God. Summarizing what he said according to that argument. Saturday was for whom? For the Jews. The law was also for the Jews. So, nor the Saturday nor the law have nothing to do with us. They are left behind and the new covenant is established. Now, we have to understand that to the light of the Bible, there's more than one law, and if we mix one with the other, we might get confused. At least, at least we can mention three laws. The laws of health of the Old Testament, applicable today and can be demonstrated in the light of science the Law of Ten Commandments and the Ritual Law. He talked about two covenants, the Old Covenant and the New One. It seems to me that the book of Hebrews on chapter 9, let's make a quick reading of chapter 9. We are going to understand just by reading it doesn't need any explanation. However, if we consider in some point of this text that needs to be explained, we'll do. Book of Hebrews chapter 9. So we can understand what it was for the Old Covenant and what for the New One. According to the priest's exposition, in the Old Covenant, people had to keep the law and the Sabbath. But a new covenant was established for us Christians in the New Testament, so we don't have to keep the law nor the Sabbath. Therefore, we need to know in the light of the Bible what the Old and the New Covenant were. Hebrews 9 we are going to read the whole chapter, maybe until verse 16. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and earthly sanctuary. What did the first covenant have? An earthly sanctuary and regulations for worship. For a tent was prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table at the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain stood a tent called the Holy of Holies, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, which contained a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Above it was a cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail, these preparation having thus been made, the priests go continually into the outer tent, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the errors of the people. 
By these, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary is not yet opened as long as the outer tent is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifice are offered which cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various ablutions, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. So in the sanctuary, there was a ritual that consisted of food, beverages, and different ablutions, ceremonies, and sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins imposed until the time of Reformation, because all of the old covenant was going to be reformed and switched to a new covenant. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of the field persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of heifers sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offer himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since the death has occurred, which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. What is in the light of this chapter of Hebrews, the Old and the New Covenant? In the Old Testament, God saved for the confidence in sacrifices of animals offered. Of course, knowing that those sacrifices represented the sacrifice of Christ, the true Lamb that had to come, therefore, when John was baptizing in the Jordan and saw Christ, coming toward him, said, Behold the Lamb of God, who take away the sins of the world. So in the Old Covenant, people or the sins were forgiven through the sacrifices of animals in an earthly sanctuary, by an earthly priesthood. In the New Covenant, according to that, we just read people doesn't get saved by sacrifice of animals but by the sacrifice of Christ. That's why the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It was necessary, if you continue reading the book of Hebrews, that the blood of Christ would be shed for the forgiveness and cleaning of every sin. Now Christ died as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, ascended into heaven, entered in the heavenly sanctuary, says the book of Hebrews, a sanctuary out of this creation, not made by human hands, but God established it. So in heaven there is a sanctuary. Jesus died as a Lamb, ascended into heaven as a priest, because He is the true priest in the new covenant entered into the Holy of Holies as the High Priest and intercedes on our behalf, because He died and shed His blood and has promised to come a second time and take us to His kingdom. So in the light of Hebrews chapter 9 and some other passages, of course in the Bible, but specially in Hebrews 9, Old Covenant is forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice of animals in an earthly sanctuary with a human priesthood. 
new covenant is forgiveness of sin through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, not of lambs or animals being offered once for all and ministered not in a sanctuary made by hands, but in a heavenly sanctuary. And he is the true and high priest. In the Old Covenant, there were the priests for minister in the sanctuary. When that covenant ended, or had accomplished on the minister of Jesus, there is no reason nowhere in the Bible for the ministry of priesthood. Now, we have the priesthood from who? Of Jesus. And the high priest of who? Of Jesus. No, no, let's follow the rules of exposition. The questions come at the end. Now, we are going to read Galatians, the passage used by Luis Toro, referring to moral law of the Ten Commandments and that we are not under slavery. Galatians 5 verse 6 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. Notice that Galatians 5 is continuing Galatians 4. Then Galatians 5 is talking of a ritual of the Old Covenant. What was that? Circumcision. So in that context of Galatians 5, Galatians 4 is not referring to the law of what? Moral law. Although it mentions that was given at Mount Sinai. The covenant given on Mount Sinai goes in two directions. It's a covenant of the Ten Commandments, but also a covenant regarding the ritual law because Moses received strict directions of how the ritual should be in the sanctuary. Well, now to every one of us is clear that following Jesus' example is essential. Because we could not be called Christians if we did not follow Christ. We could not be called Christians if we do not practice what Christ thought. So we have to see Christ in the Gospels and do a careful examination of what Christ practiced and thought. It is very important to us so we can get to know if we are actually true Christians following the example and the teaching of Jesus. Let's see Luke 4, 16. Please do me the favor and read it. When did Jesus go to the synagogue? Saturday. And he was just passing there and said, Is there any worship today? It says that was his custom. A custom is a habit that one always repeats and that way he practices it. So it was a custom of Jesus to come to the synagogue, the church, on Saturday. Now it says that he stood up for reading. 
we can find in the Bible meanings, not only on Sundays, but in other days. And we do not find specifications in the Word of God that those meanings did have to do with the keeping of a day. And people was gathering to keep that day. He pretends to demonstrate that because they gather for breaking the bread, eating or be together, sharing, play football or anything, collecting for the poor. Then Jesus and Christians establish a day of worshiping. But I think that the example of Jesus is conclusive and he says that he went to church on Saturday, not to eat or sharing the bread or any other activities. It says that stood up for reading, didn't he? He went for worshiping to study the Word of God, to share the Word of God, to congregate with his brothers. Now, let us suppose that the law and the Saturday were for the Old Covenant And on the New Covenant, we don't have to keep the law, nor the Sabbath. Then, I want you to respond or give me an explanation of the following passages of the Bible from the New Testament. First one to read is 1st of John, chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. And note that I'm reading in the New Testament, New Covenant. Not in the Old Testament, Old Covenant. I could have made an exposition regarding what the Bible says of the Sabbath in the Old Testament, but I saved energy because according to his interpretation, all of the Old Testament doesn't work anymore, does it? We have to throw it in the garbage. It's not Word of God anymore. We are going to read New Testament, New Covenant. The Word of God says, and by this we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who does not keep his commandments cannot say he knows God. That's why the Bible is saying, by this we may be sure that we know him. And it cannot be that some people pretend to be Christians, but they don't know God because they don't keep his commandments and keep saying, He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We have come to look for truth in the light of the Word of God. And what do the Word of God say regarding the commandments? Now you tell me, who are the liars? The ones who keep the commandments and the Sabbath, which is the fourth commandment of the law of God, or the ones who don't keep them? Who are the liars? Respond. We just read it in the Word of God. It's not me who is saying it. There it is, in the Word of God. Who are the liars? But whoever keeps his word in him, truly love for God is perfected. He talked about love of God. We agree with the love of God in the New Covenant. We have to love one another and show respect. Love is above everything. But truly love for God is perfected in those who keep the Word. In whom truly love for God is perfected? In those who keep His Word. By this, we may be sure that we are in Him. He who says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. But you have not shown us that Christ taught us to keep the commandments, 
Do you want to see it? Vamos al Evangelio de Juan. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6. Word of Jesus. Jesus was the best teacher in the world, is the incarnated truth. That's why the Bible says He is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to know what Jesus thought, what He preached, the way He lived. And if we do it this way, we are the followers of Christ and true disciples of Jesus. And we can be called Christians, but if we don't follow the example of Jesus, His teachings, could we be called Christians? Well, you can call yourselves Christians, but in the light of the Bible, you can't. Then, verse 15, John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Word of Jesus. Who said that? And if Jesus said it, what do we have to do? Jesus is the supreme authority. And he is above any other person or teaching, isn't he? Because he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with Him. His presence is with the one who keeps His word and commandments. He who doesn't love me doesn't keep my words. Okay, getting back to Galatians on chapter 5. I think, and I'm talking about the law, because the law is on Saturday, you have to keep the law, because Saturday is the fourth commandment of God's law. Now, I think that on an exposition like this, according to what your spiritual leader said, we deserve some respect and kindness. And the rules were established by himself. While he spoke, nobody interrupted him. And at the same time, while I'm talking, nobody should interrupt me. Yes, that is true, and it is necessary to respect each other. You, brother, made a mistake. You shouldn't ask them, because if you ask them, they're going to respond. But if you ask and you don't want to be responded, then don't ask. Just expose and don't ask. I am exposing for a yes or a no, not to be told what I have to expose, because the topic and if the conditions are not given, I mean, then we better finish, don't we? If I would invite him to my church, I'm sure my brothers would not do that to him. We would be permitted to expose freely as the rules were established. I would like to be invited to where your church is and full like this. And you give me the chance in order to see how their education is compared to ours. Okay, well, consider that a possibility. Okay. Let us continue with Galatians. I am about to finish Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. It has to be with the commandments, hasn't it? Fornication. 
uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. That those which do such things also violate the commandments, says the word of God clearly, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then we can read in Revelation chapter 21, verses 17 through 21. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who is thirsty come, let him who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of his book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of his prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Here we have these passages of the Word of God, very clear regarding the importance of keeping the Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment that talks about the observance of Saturday as a true day of resting. Well, thank you. I really do apologize to, to the brother for the ones who cannot lump it. It is not right. It's not right. Uh, I'm so sorry, but it's, it's just not right. I don't agree with that. That's how we, we will be recognized in the love. Do not lose the commandment of love. Calm down. Because everything is being recorded, so everything's being seen and heard. So there's not a problem. You don't have to scream or shout. I mean, the main thing is to be watching and listening. You can analyze what I have exposed, heard what he exposed. Now it's time for the questions and answers. Now it's the debate. We are going to talk. Uh, he and I. Come over here, brother. We're going to talk, you and me, like friends. That's how we are going to talk, like true friends. I want... What, 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 is, your, what is your name? Samuel. Samuel, I don't want you to feel like a stranger with me. We are going to talk as if we were the only two persons here, and there were no cameras watching us at all in a nice dialogue among Christians that love each other and don't hate each other. Nor he hates me, nor I do either. We are knowing each other, and we are going to talk on a dialogue. About the things that I exposed, he didn't agree with some of them. I said some other things when he was speaking I didn't agree with. But now we are going to make things clear. He is going to talk, and I am going to talk. I always forget your name, sorry. My head is not helping me. But, but I want everybody to observe something. It's not about fighting. It's about sharing on a dialogue. Samuel, when you respond to me, respond with the Bible. And when I respond, I'll do the same. And we are going to make things clear with the Bible. If you want, you can read, Luis, or... Okay. You said something, Brother Samuel, that I don't agree with. You said that Jesus Christ gathered on Saturday to pray and read the Word of God, and that is true. Why did Jesus congregate on Saturday? Because he was a Jew. Why the apostles gathered with Jesus on Saturday? Because they were all Jews, 
And the law commanded that all Jews to congregate on Saturdays. Jesus Christ was still living in the Old Testament. The New Testament begins with the death, with the death and resurrection of Christ. That is why I showed him that when Christ rises up, Christians do not gather on Saturdays. It's already New Testament. Before Christ dies on the cross, it is the Old Testament. I told you that New Testament begins after death of Christ. I told you on Romans 7, and it's been recorded where it says that with the death, the woman stays free to marry another man, remember? Romans 7 dies the Old Testament with the death of Christ begins the New Testament. You show me Jesus Christ gather with his disciples before dying in the Old Testament. And I showed you Jesus Christ gather with his apostles after his resurrection on Sunday. I show you three quotes. After Christ ascends, I show you two more quotes where he did not mean to drink Pepsi Cola and cookies, as you suggested, but where they gather for the breaking of bread. And if you don't know, with all respect, I must remind you that in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and following, says that the early Christians gather for praying and for the breaking of bread. And if you don't know what the breaking of bread is, St. Luke chapter 24, verse 31 and following, says that they recognize him on the breaking of bread. So from there on, they gather for the breaking of bread. It's not what you said. I'm going on Sunday to collect. And if they did not gather on Sunday, who is going to give him their collection? Nobody. So that's what I don't agree. And you come to say that we all have to do what Jesus Christ did, but Jesus Christ gathered in the synagogue on Saturday. Therefore, we have to follow the example. If not, then we are not Christians. Do me a favor. Read St. Luke chapter 2 because he also read St. Luke before and I read St. Luke chapter 2 verse 21. Remember that Jesus Christ is the example and if he reads that Jesus Christ gathered before on Saturday with his disciples, also St. Luke chapter 2 verse 21 says, And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. We have to follow the example. Question. At the end of eight years, Pastor? Of course I did not get circumcised, but circumcision is recommended as a matter of health nowadays in the Old Testament. I mean, I did not get circumcised because circumcision was a ritual of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Okay, so we agree that Jesus Christ did things of the Old Testament. As he got circumcised, he had to do it because he was a Jew. And it was still current the Old Testament. The same as when he gathered with his apostles in the Old Covenant. It was a ritual that had to be done. But I want you to show me that Jesus, risen up, gathered in the New Testament with his disciples. And if you don't do it, well, then I do want to show you that Jesus Christ gathered together with his apostles on Sunday. So do me a favor and show me in the New Testament that after Christ dies, gather together with the apostles on Saturday. Well, I insist that Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It was a teaching, a commandment of Jesus. He did not say, If Jews love me, you will keep my commandments. He said it to all of us. If you love me, what? You shall keep my commandments. What happens to Saturday since Sabbath is the fourth commandment of the law of God. 
That's why I like to dialogue. That's the second thing which I don't agree with you. And I am going to show you with the Bible. You read me two quotes. First letter of John, chapter 2, verse 3. The second one was St. John, chapter 16, verse 15, 14, 15. We are going to read not to convert you. I'm going to explain to them that it's not like you were saying. Read first John 14, 15. That one. Use your magnifier glass to see where this brother is a little confused. If you love me, who is speaking, the Father or the Son? The Son. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It does not say the commandments of the Old Covenant. It says you will keep my commandments because in the New Testament, Jesus Christ has new commandments. If it would have said, if you love me, you will keep the Ten Commandments. Perfect. But here he's saying, if you love me, you will keep the commandments of me. And if you want to see that Jesus Christ has his own commandments, because he is God. Do you remember that the difference is that to Moses, God gave the Ten Commandments in the Old Covenant? Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. Nobody gave the commandments to him. He established his own commandments. He has his own commandments. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you. Who is speaking? Jesus, a new commandment I give to you. He is not like Moses that brings a commandment from other. He is God. He gives his commandments. I give you a commandment. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he thinks that he's talking about the Ten Commandments. That it's an error. Read it again, Luis. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. As I have loved you, continue. By these all men will know that you are my disciples. By these all men will know that you are my disciples. Keeping the Ten Commandments or keeping the commandments of Jesus. If you have love for one another. That's how we recognize Christians. Christians are not recognized by keeping the commandments of the Old Covenant. Christians are recognized by keeping the commandments of Christ. Do you remember what he commanded to his disciples in Matthew 28, verse 19? Good question. Will you let me respond to him? Okay. I'm going to explain it to you. Turn the cameras and see how the Adventists behave. Let's see if he's the same as Catholics, if Catholics did the same to him. Although there are a few Adventists, look at their behavior. What if we were at their church? And everybody treated me like this. He was complaining about that here. There are so many Catholics, fold the church. And someone over there said something. Look how he's treating me. I mean, things are not like it seems. Let's show some respect. Here is my brother respecting the Adventist and finished. Thank you, thank you. But I'm going to answer your question. Very glad, very glad. Anyway, he was going to ask me that question and I'm going to answer it to you. Matthew 28, 19 and following, when Jesus sent his apostles, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And let's see if it says, teaching them the Ten Commandments. 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. My commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The other quote you read, uh, 1 of John, chapter 2, verse 3, who is speaking? What is he saying? Let's see if he's referring to Jesus or not. How do you recognize Jesus? Let's see if he's referring to Jesus or not. See if it refers to Jesus. How do we recognize Jesus if we keep his commandments? What commandments? Those of the Old Covenant or the commandments of Jesus? He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments, is a liar. He's a liar and he said that referred to the Ten Commandments. Let's see. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly love for God is perfected. If one keeps what word? Truly love for God is with him. Go on. By these we may be sure that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, if he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Who are we talking about? About Jesus Christ because he came down here to give us an example. And we ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So we are talking about the commandments of Christ. We are not talking about the Ten Commandments of the Old Covenant. No, sir. He thinks, and that is an error, and we respect him. But I am clarifying that it's not so. Now the question the brother asked me. If you let me, I can respond to him. Or you ask me another one. Well, I don't understand why you said that he treated you bad. He was just simply asking a question. He shouldn't ask because of the agreement we made, didn't we? That you don't ask. But he asked me. He changed the rules of the games. And I said, answer to him, no problem. If you authorize, I respond. Why do we keep the commandments on the catechesis we give to every person? Let him, com let him complete his question. No, no, the question is this. Why do we have in the catechesis the Ten Commandments? That's the question. And if we don't keep the Old Covenant, then why do we keep the Ten Commandments and why we teach them to the kids in the catechesis? That is the question I'm going to respond. We cannot accomplish them exactly. The commandments given by Jesus, we have to keep them. And Jesus Christ gave those commandments we teach in the catechesis. Where did he give them? We are going to read it in verse 20, where Jesus Christ gave us those commandments that we teach in the catechesis, not the ones from the Old Covenant, although so many of them match. They really match, but they are not exactly the same. Let's see 520. For I tell you, for I tell you, that's why it says my commandments. Repeat it. For I tell you. For I tell you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he wants us to be more perfect than the Old Covenant, the scribes and the Pharisees, and listen to the following. You have heard that it was said to the men of old. Old Testament, Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, the tables of stone of Moses. It was said, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. That's one of the commandments. Go on. For I tell you, for I tell you, there, right there, for I tell you, so he is giving us a new commandment, a new commandment. He resumes, why do we teach our kids of catechesis not to kill? Because Jesus retook them and added a little more. 
He said, for I tell you, he resumed the Old Testament and updated. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. For I tell you, he is superior to Moses. To Moses they were giving on the tables, not to Jesus. For I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. And he comes to explain it on verse 27. You have heard, you have heard, that is was said, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That was already in the Old Covenant. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, but I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. That's why we teach the kids in the catechesis the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery, not to consent in pure thoughts and desires, because we can't sin in thoughts. So they are already different than the old. That did not exist in the old. That is new because Jesus said it, and what Jesus resumed from the old one, we keep it. But he did not say anything about Sabbath. You have to keep the Sabbath, for I tell you. No, he talked about this, about others, but about the Sabbath, he did not say anything. So if you love me, you will keep my commandments, the commandments of mine, for he is the Lord. Look at Luke 6.46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? He is the Lord. He is God. And we have to do what He tells us. He never said, you have to keep the Sabbath. Just you will keep my commandments. No, sorry, you already had your time. And you yourself said that it was His turn. Now He is going to ask. Well, let us continue with the topic being exposed by priest Luis, who is saying that the commandments absolutely don't work anymore. A new question regarding the commandments, and when I talk about the commandments, of course I'm including Saturday. Which doctrine is being exposed since Saturday is the fourth commandment of God's law? You can look it up in Exodus 20, verse 5. Look, brother, sorry to interrupt. You ask me and I respond. Then give me the opportunity to ask you. Do you know what I mean? So not only you question me, but I also have the right to ask you and be responded by you, okay? So my question is on Mark 10, verses 17 through 19. Mark 10, 17, 19. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill, do not commit adultery. Do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Then Jesus is trying to make him understand, responding to his question, saying, to enter into the eternal life, you must keep what? The commandments the Word of God. It's all right. I've just told you the commandments that Jesus resumed. Read it again. Yes, the same one. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do we restart the commandment? Yes, because Jesus gave it. 
he restarted it. It is existing and we teach it in the catechesis. Do not commit adultery. Do we retake it? Yes, we teach it in the catechesis because Jesus retook it. Do not steal. Do we teach it? Yes, because Jesus retook it. Do not bear false witness. Do we retake it? Yes, because the Lord retook it. Now, tell me, where is Saturday? Go on. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And where is Saturday? Why Jesus did not retake it? Why Jesus did not retake Saturday? So if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The ones I gave to you, those ones he gave we Catholics keep them. Since he did not retake Saturday, and it was so important to keep it, if Christians have to keep the commandment to be saved, why Jesus did not say it? Now my question, I responded to you, and now it is my turn to ask as we agreed, didn't we? But if you ask me now, you don't give me the chance to argue about what you just said to me. You'll have an opportunity, but then you let me ask. So if you want to ask about another topic, don't argue me, but ask your question. James 2.10, because at the beginning you were saying that the Ten Commandments from the Sinai, those are left behind. But now you are telling me that the Catholic Church is keeping some of them, but some others not, nor Saturday. That's what you said. We retake them. We keep some of them, but not Saturday. The Bible says in James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. He who keeps nine, but fails in one, becomes guilty of what? Of all of it. That's what the Word of God says. Now you are very selective, retaking these. Let's keep these, but not Saturday. In other words, one has the choice to choose which ones to keep and which ones not. And some other will say, I want these, but I want to be an adulterer. I keep these, but I want to be a killer. I think that the Word of God is clear about, about what it's saying and what we just read. We cannot be selective taking what we want from the Word of God or what we think or what we believe and not everything else. I think that all New Testament and not only the New Testament but the whole Bible is Word of God. That's how I like it. And I have the answer. When James says, Am I not allowed to respond? Then I don't know what to do. If I'm not allowed to respond, then I don't know what I should do. He says that I'm not giving him the opportunity to ask him because I argue and he refutes me, so he doesn't have the chance to ask me. Then I tell him the only way you can ask me is just asking without refuting me what I'm saying. But if we keep going this way, I say you refute, then let's go ahead that way. I dance to the beating you play. I keep on track to the rhythm you want. This is a dialogue, no problem. Main thing is sharing. This is not life or death matter. It's about sharing ideas with the Word of God. James says, yes. James 2.10 says that certainly we have to keep not only one, because when you keep one, you have to keep all of them. But I want to read two quotes from this brother on is Galatians 5.4 and the other one, Galatians 3. We can read it from verse 5. We're going to start with Galatians 5.4. 
you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. You have fallen away from Christ. Read it from verse 3. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is bound to keep the whole law. Those who have been circumcised are bound to keep the whole law, not us. The circumcised are bound to keep the whole law. And pay attention when James says that if one keep one of them and doesn't keep the other ones, he is talking to those who want the good because they have the law but only what is good for them. If you get circumcised, you have to keep the whole law. And if you don't get circumcised, you are not bound to keep the whole law. Now it's the law of Jesus Christ, the commandments of Jesus Christ that you have to keep. If I keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, that is important. That's why Jesus said, you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, let's see what it says, Romans 2, 17. But if you call yourself a Jew, if you are a Jew, but if you call yourself a Jew, if you are a Jew, and rely upon the law, and rely upon the law, and boast of your relation to God, and boast of your relation to God, like this brother, because he relies upon the law of the Ten Commandments. And it's not talking about ceremonies and others. It's the Ten Commandments you are going to see if you are proud of keeping the law. Because that way you please God. Repeat it again. And boast of your relation to God. And boast of your relation to God. Pay attention. And know His will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed in the law. Because you are instructed in the law. And you will see that is the law of the Ten Commandments. And you know how to behave according to the circumstances. And if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind. You are sure that you are a guide to the blind. And if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind. He thinks he's got the truth, that he has to teach that. People is in darkness. He thinks he's a guide to the blind. A light to those who are in darkness. Light in the dark. He has to give light to the world. A corrector of the foolish. A corrector of the foolish. And he has to teach. A teacher of children. A teacher of children in faith. Having in the law. Having in the law. And you'll see that is the law of the Ten Commandments the embodiment of knowledge and truth. The law is essential. The embodiment of knowledge and truth. The embodiment of knowledge and truth. Now attune your ears. You then who teach others. You then who teach others. Will you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing. That is the Ten Commandments. Do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Now go to chapter 3 verse 10. As it is written, as it is written, none is righteous, none is righteous, not one, no one, no one understands, no one understands, no one seeks for God, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, all have turned aside, together they have gone wrong, no one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. 
The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Look how the apostle is telling them. You boast like the Adventists in the law and the commandments. However, we know they do not keep them. They say they keep them and that is the rule of the law. And St. Paul says no, those we don't have to keep. But the ones that Christ left us? Yes. The ones that Christ resumed? Yes. What Christ did not retake? Like Saturday? No. Because we have to keep it in the New Testament. The commandments that Jesus Christ gave us, so we have to see that there are commandments that Jesus Christ resumed and those are important to us. The circumcised must keep all the commandments, we must not. Can I ask you? Or you argue, whatever you want. Then let's go ahead that way. I understood in what you just exposed, in what you just read, that the law doesn't work anymore. It is for the Jews, not for Christians. There is a contradiction in your response to the brother. You said that in the Catechism, you said that in the Catechism, you teach some commandments, so you are the same in the law. I explained that we retake what Jesus Christ left us, but he doesn't want to understand because it's not convenient for him. It's not that we want it. It's what Jesus left. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Jesus Christ never retook Saturday. He did left not to steal, not to commit adultery. He did left those. That's why we take them. But if you find a chapter and verse where Jesus commanded to keep Saturday, that would be it for me. Well, you insist that. We can give the opportunity to ask. Can we give it? When you don't want to talk anymore, tell me, and we don't talk anymore. But the audience is not allowed to ask, as we agreed, because everything might be out of control. If you have no questions, I do have some. Okay, according to the rules established, the audience is not allowed to ask. Everybody would like to question them. We have to obey the rules established at the beginning. Because if we give the opportunity, it would be for each one of you. Now, Jesus more than be a Jew, he was the Son of God. And according to the biblical history, the Jews appear so many years after creation because they were descendants of Jacob. Then, you said that some things Jesus thought were for the Jews, including the commandments. Since he was a Jew, he incarnated and participated in human history. But actually, in the light of the Bible, Jesus was one with God and exists from eternity because Jesus is also God. So the Ten Commandments are not for the Jews. They are Jesus's. They are God's. 
because he gave them in Mount Sinai in tables of stone. But when we read the story in the Bible, we find that before Mount Sinai, Israelite people was keeping what? The commandments, and in chapter 2, it's the beginning of Genesis. We are going to read Genesis chapter 2. Jesus was not yet. He had not incarnated yet. As Jew, in chapter 2, there was no Jewish people, no Old Covenant, no New Covenant. It was the beginning of history. And in chapter 2, verse 3, God says, Let's start on verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. That means it was the beginning of creation. There were no Jews, no God's people, nor Jesus had come to incarnate as Son of God in the offspring of Jewish people. So in times of creation it says, And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and allowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. In the light of the Bible, Saturday is not a Jewish commandment. It was established by God when the Jews did not exist yet. Adam and Eve were not Jews. It was established at the Garden of Eden. Okay, I'm going to respond. That's how I like it. Look, brother. What you are saying that God rested on the seventh day is not referring to the days of the week that you have and I have in times of Adam and Eve. There were no days of the week. And I'm going to show you with the Bible and you are going to read it so you can see that you have been fooled. You quote a Genesis, I quote Genesis, I dance to your rhythm. Genesis 1.14 Those were not the days of the week. When God rested from the work, it does not refer to the days of the week you and I have. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. No, it refers to another thing, the days of the Lord. How do we know? How are there to say a nonsense? That they were not the days of the week? Easy. Because on chapter 1, verse 14, God is creating the world. And you can see that in chapter 1, verse 14, God created the days of the week that you have and I have. He created them on the fourth day of creation and you'll see it in the Bible. So you can see how this brother has been fooled. Genesis 1.14 And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. There were no days, no nights, and He is creating them now. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Until then, we're starting the days of the week. And let them be lights in the firmament of heavens to give light upon the Go earth. On. And it was so. And God made the two great lights. Guess what? The sun and the moon. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. There was no day because there was no sun. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. There was no day, no night. And God saw that it was good. And attune your ears. What day created God? The days of the week? Pay attention. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. And there was evening and there was morning, so God did not create the world on the days of the week that you and I have. That is an error, to think that it is said literally the days of the week. Nope. Let's see. Listen something. 
I think, brother, I don't know if you agree with me that we can be finishing. You do your last intervention and then I do mine. Do you agree? With all due respect that you deserve, I want to tell you that the book of Genesis is, is a book highly literal. He is not creating symbolic man, nor symbolic plants, nor symbolic days. We cannot get out of Bible context. Make the Bible say what is not saying. It has to be interpreted within its context. Then, if we say that those weren't days, literal, morning and afternoons, but they represent a thousand, two thousand years or whatever, then we'll have to say that what the Lord created, since is the story of creation, the trees, fishes, the sun and the moon are also symbolic. Now he says that the Lord created the days on the fourth day. But let's read it again. Verse 3. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called it night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. It was the first day working. Now I think that in the Bible we have to understand that God is God of order and He speaks within the human logic. He doesn't speak strange things to confuse us or things we cannot understand. If the days are not literal, but represent any amount of years, so the Lord creates the plants on the third day and takes the thousand years to create the sun, how those plants live during so many years without the sun? We know that they need the sun for the photosynthesis. I'm going to respond with the Bible. Look that I'm not inventing anything. See that I'm giving you chapters and verses and he doesn't want to read them. I am going to explain easy why the Bible say read verse 1. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called it night. I'm, now, I'm going to explain what days he's talking about. Sun did not exist yet. It was going to rule days and nights and then weeks. He's talking about what 2 Peter 3 says on verse 8. Peter wrote it. This is biblical. This is biblical. It's not that I'm taking out of the context what the Bible is saying. Read it, Luis. Do not ignore this one fact. Do not ignore it. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved. Do not ignore it. That with the Lord one day is a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. So for the Lord, one thing is a lot different, the days, than for us. 
In God's days, the days on Genesis 1 is like a thousand days. But the days of the week, God created them on the fourth day, not of the week, but God's days meaning years. Now, you are seeing that I'm showing with the Bible because I'm showing with the sacred scriptures. We are going to conclude. If you have something to conclude, fine, fine too. Do not ask me questions. Summarize what you want to summarize and conclude. The passage that he just read, that for the Lord a thousand years are like one day, has to be interpreted correctly. It is saying like one day, not meaning one day. Totally different. Now, if I say a serpent is like a rope, that means that the rope is a serpent? So in language structures, in Spanish, we understand that comparisons can be made, but it's not a fact, like this one. I did not say that one day was. I said like a thousand years for God. I'm just showing that God has different days than ours. That to God is not the same. That's all I have said. I want to conclude, I want to conclude all that we are saying with Isaiah chapter 1 verse 13 and Colossians. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 13 and you are going to hear it. I don't know if one of the brothers want to read. Lend them their Bible because I want you to read on your Bible's version Isaiah 1.13 and we are going to compare it with Colossians 2.16. Isaiah 1.13 Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon, new moon and Sabbath and Saturday and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure inequity and solemn assembly. He's talking about the Jews' assemblies on Saturday. I cannot endure inequity and solemn assembly. It's an iniquity. He's not talking about our assemblies. He's talking about ceremonial rites. He's talking about Jewish ceremonies that the Lord doesn't want it anymore. Now, Colossians 2.16. That is the same. Colossians 2.16 talks about ceremonial rites. No, read it. Let's see what it has to say, Colossians 2.16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you and let no one, nor the Adventists, nor the Jews, pass judgment on you. Questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Let no one to pass judgment on us, because we don't keep Saturday. Go on. These are only a shadow of what is to come. These are only a shadow. But the substance belongs to Christ. Come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, taking his stand on visions, puffed up without reason, by his sensuous mind, 
and not holding fast to the head. So observe what the Bible says. I just want to let you with the Word of God and thank everybody for coming to these brothers and you, the audience for hanging on, God bless. For we all need to find the truth. Everyone can get his own conclusions. This video is going to be on YouTube. You can check it out. You can look it up and share it. See that we were not wrong. Here these brothers are treated with respect because there is freedom of religion. But they have to know why the Catholic Church celebrates on Sunday. Let's give a warm applause to the brothers. I want to thank you by heart. Doesn't matter who won and who lost. Main thing is that we have shared the Word of God. And secondly, there's a testimony that Christians don't fight. We can control ourselves and dialogue as brothers. This is ecumenism. Let us say a prayer for farewell to thank God for this, so we don't go away as little animals. O oh Lord Almighty, we thank you for this beautiful opportunity you have given us to share your word. It's a lamp to our feet and light to our path to drive out the darkness. We give you thanks for sharing your word with these brothers, our brothers. Lord, may your word, the seed of the kingdom, that has been sowed in the minds and hearts of every listener, grow up and bear fruits for eternal life. And you, O God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of our fathers, God of the apostles, you that have created every one of us, to you be the glory, the honor, the power, and the adoration forever and ever. Amen. Live Jesus Christ! Let's give an applause for our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, my dear brothers, there it is. So you can understand our brothers. They say to have the truth, but they cannot prove it. A lie lasts until the truth arrives. We are struggling to rescue the truth, that the world may know the truth. And if we Catholics prepare ourselves, it's like when a light turns on in the midst of darkness, the shadows start dissipating. Time is now for Catholics to turn on the light of truth. Jesus said that you are the light of the world. We cannot hide. Let us be brave, courageous, to tell our brothers, we respect all the lies you are teaching, we give them respect, but we chose between the lie and the truth, we chose the truth, between believing what men say and what Jesus Christ say, we choose Jesus Christ. We are not fake believers, but believers. Those who believe in those pastors, fake believers, those who believe in Jesus Christ, believers. Remember how I asked his brothers to show me in the Bible where it says in the New Testament to keep Saturday, that the apostles keep it, that Jesus Christ had commanded it. They did not show it. Why? Easy. Because it's not. Well, I'm very glad, brothers, to all of our brothers that don't belong to the Catholic Church but follow us through the social media by heart, I wish you the best, and keep listening all of our videos. You have my permission to insult me. Do and say whatever you want. Do and say whatever you want, though you'll be accountable to God when you die. I assure you, it is true. Up above, there's God who watches down. He taught the commandment of law, to treat each other like brothers. If you from there insult me and tell me whatever you want, that's your problem. 
The day you die, you'll have to meet God and be accountable. To Catholics, tell them to go on. If you want to study the Bible, see the teachings of the Bible, my videos. A Catholic must not listen to Protestant teachings, no Protestant channels. There are channels of the Catholic Church where you can be formed, where you take the Bible and study. Watch the videos one or two or three times until you get them in your mind and heart and be able to defend your faith. Well, soon we'll be uploading another video. We are now here in Colombia, in Cucuta. We are sharing our faith and we ask for blessings to all of you. And as a priest of the Most High, I wish that Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations! You have a big hug from a distance.